Well, hello and welcome everyone. My name is Celeste Harrison and I'm so happy to be welcoming you to today's Explorer Classroom. At National Geographic, we believe in the power of wonder and of exploration to change our world. The very heart of our community at National Geographic is of course our explorers. Explorers are amazing scientists, groundbreaking researchers, and super powerful storytellers. We're really proud to be able to connect them with classrooms through our Explorer Classroom program. Explorer Classroom is a short lesson from an explorer followed by an extended Q&A with students all around the world. We have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of you joining in today. Thank you all for registering. It's so good to see you. Let me know where you're watching from in the chat bar and I can give you a shout out in just a little bit. Um, but for now, I'd like to turn it over to our main event for the day. We're joined by the fabulous botanical illustrator, Narupa Rao. She's got a wonderful lesson for us and I can't wait to hear it. All yours, Narupa. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so that you can see what I have prepared for us today. Um, here we go. Okay, so thank you so much for joining me today. And um, my name is Narupa. I'm a National Geographic Explorer from India. Um, and that's where I am right now, staying indoors, just like the rest of you. Um, and I just wanted to start off today by showing you some of the plants that we derived a lot of our most common foods from. And it may be a flower or a fruit or a seed, but we eat all of these in some form or the other and in, in most of our homes. And I wanted to know if you could identify them. And you can just discuss this at home since we won't really be able to chat back and forth, but just discuss this at home with whoever's next to you. Um, so here we go. Um, first of all, do you know what that is? It's not, it doesn't look like uh, what we expect, but it's actually a flower. And it comes from this plant, which is a banana plant. This is the, the green fruit that you see above the flower are unripe banana flowers. Um, let me just show you another one. Uh, this is a climbing vine, which produces all of those little green fruit that you can see hanging sort of like grapes. Uh, we pluck these fruit, dry them, grind them up, and we get pepper. That's the same black pepper that we sprinkle over our eggs every morning. And let's try another one. So do you know what this is? It's a kind of orchid, um, which we grow in order to harvest its fruit. And the fruit are the little yellowy green finger-like um, things that you can see in this picture just next to the flower. And these fruit are dried to produce one of the world's most beloved and expensive flavorings, natural vanilla. Of course, now a lot of vanilla is synthetically produced, but this is where uh, vanilla was originally derived from and continues to be derived from in its most expensive natural form. So if you got all of these or even any of them right, then congratulations, you're a plant lover. But I know most of us don't know, know where our food comes from and most of us don't know the plants that grow around us. But I think we need to question that because plants are really important, right? All animals on earth, ourselves included, rely on plants directly or indirectly for food. And of course, plants take in carbon dioxide and release oxygen into the atmosphere, which we can't do without. But besides how valuable they are, they're also incredibly fascinating. And that's what I wanna show you today. I'm a botanical illustrator. So in short, that means I paint plants just like this. So this is the process of me painting one leaf and I sort of layer up uh, um, different layers of textures and veins to show how complex that one leaf is. And that's how long it can take just to, just to paint that one part of a plant. Um, and I live right here. This is, a, this is a map of India. I live in the south in a city called Bangalore, which you can see written in red. Um, and just to the west of us is an incredible range of hills that we call the Western Ghats. Um, it goes up along the entire west coast of India. And my parents would bring us here a lot when we were kids. We spent so much time here. So it's, it's become a place that's really meaningful to me. It's filled with a whole host of habitat types, including rainforests and swamps and grasslands. And uh, surprisingly, it contains about 30% of all the plants and wildlife that we can find in India, 
despite the fact that it covers only six, about 6% six of India's entire landmass. Um, and so you can see how incredibly important that is for the biodiversity of the country. Even around the world, it's considered a biodiversity hotspot just because of how many plants and animals you can find here, which you can't find anywhere else in the world. Um, so some of the most common animals that even you would know, despite the fact that I'm assuming you've never been to, uh, to India, you would definitely recognize a lot of these animals, um, like the tiger, the elephant, leopards, peacocks, cobras, they all live here and they're famous all over the world. But unlike in this, this picture, they don't actually live in isolation. They all need a habitat to live in and food to live off. That's, they basically need plants. Uh, but most of us, even in India, can't name the plants that these animals live among, uh, the plants that they eat and use as their habitats. But they're really important and without them, the animals wouldn't survive in the wild. Um, and just like most forests in the world, the Western Ghats too are constantly under threat of deforestation. But there are many scientists uh, who are trying to regrow these forests with a lot of the native trees that birds and animals rely on for food and shelter. And this happens in India too. And there, there are two scientists that I met maybe about five years, uh, maybe sorry, four years ago now. And they were running a, re a reforestation program in the Western Ghats in India, where they were trying to grow a lot of the native trees. Um, and they wanted to document them in some way. But if you've ever been to a forest, you, you may have realized that these trees are really, really tall. So if you try photographing one of those trees, this is what you might get. So that's my friend there standing in the red t-shirt. And you can see how, how tiny she looks next to that tree. Um, this tree is about 140 feet tall. That's 26 times my height. So if you try photographing a tree like that, you might not be able to fit it in, the, in, an, in a camera frame. And there's another problem. Let me show you another photograph. Can you really distinguish any one tree from this photograph? Not really, right? There are so many other different species of bushes and trees. Uh, surrounding this one tree that you, you can't really isolate it or make out any of its distinguishing characteristics. Um, so these scientists found it really difficult to, to photograph these trees uh, in any detail. So they came to me and we decided to give illustration a shot. So this is what we did. We would look at the base of the tree up close and then we'd climb up the hill and we'd see its crown rising above the canopy. And you can see from that second picture that you can't really tell what's happening in between because there's so many other smaller trees and shrubs that, that uh, cover the middle portion of the tree. But we could, working with the scientists, we could kind of imagine what the rest of the tree would look like and put it all together into one painting. And it's because of the white background, you can very clearly distinguish what this tree would look like. And through this process, we were able to draw about 30 of the native tree species. Let me show you some of them here. The last one, you can see those tiny little fruit are actually jackfruit, which I'm massive. They're about this, this big in real life, but they look so tiny on that tree. So you can see from these drawings that it's very easy to tell their shape and their branching patterns and their, their flowering patterns. And you, you can distinguish a lot of the really important characteristics from them that you might not be able to tell from a photograph. So that's one of the really cool things that you can do with illustration. And I'll tell you how I went about creating these, these drawings. This is me sitting um, on the edge of a cliff, looking at uh, drawing the top of a tree. And so I would create sketches like these uh, in the forest. And then I would take them back to my studio and make the final painting because that final painting can, can take quite a long time to make. Um, so this is something that I have done with my friends uh, who, are, who are also Nat Geo explorers. Um, one of them is a photographer who you can see with the camera. And the other one is my cousin who's a botanist, Siddharth. And uh, we went out into the jungle quite a bit, uh, just 
find some of the most incredible plants that we could find. Um, and the Western Ghats is actually so close to the city that we live in. It's only maybe a five hour drive away. Uh, but the, the difference between the city that we live in and this kind of habitat is so stark, it's crazy. Um, so this is us in, in the swamp lands um, called the Maristika swamps. And we are studying some of the native trees that you could find there. And then I would convert them into paintings right after that. And as you can see in the paintings, we're able to distinguish some of the plant species uh, more clearly. You can see two kinds of roots that you find in swampy habitats. I don't know if any of you here are from Florida, but you might have um, seen these kinds of roots in Florida. So these are basically swampy areas where there's a lot of water covering the ground and it's really difficult for uh, tree roots to breathe properly because the, the soil is so full of water. Um, but if you are a tree growing in this region, then you might have what we call aerial roots. Uh, you can see these sort of spiral like uh, roots or those tiny little loops that stick up out of, out of the ground. And those are actually uh, a way for the tree to, to breathe um, quite freely. And we were able to even include some of the animals that you might find in this region. Uh, the, the monkeys, the primates that you can see in the back of this painting are called lion tail macaques. And uh, they're very shy. And so we didn't actually see them when we, we were here, but we know that they love this habitat. So in the painting, we were able to just include them in that. And I'm gonna tell you about some of the other really cool plants that we found. Um, have you ever heard of the strangler fig? You can actually find them in the US too. And they tend to grow in sort of uh, tropical thick forests. So just come along with me here. Uh, imagine if you're a tiny little forest and you're growing in a, in a tropical jungle. You can imagine how dense that jungle is with so many other different kinds of plants and trees around. And if you have that tiny forest growing, uh, that, that tiny sapling growing on the forest floor, imagine how long it would take you to reach the top and get access to the sunlight. It might take you years. Um, so the strangler fig actually has a little strategy to kind of cut in line and get ahead. You see its seeds are dispersed by birds and the birds may drop these seeds on top of the branches of an existing tree. And the seed will germinate from there, sending its shoots up to the sun and its roots down to the ground, all the while strangling the host tree often to death. So that's what you can see in this painting of mine here. Um, this is my painting of a strangler fig. And if we zoom in, we can see that these uh, that the strangler fig is sort of wrapped itself around an entire host tree. And sometimes that host tree may die and rot away, and then you'll just get a sort of hollowed out column of roots and cylinders. Um, this, is, this is a picture of a tree that I found um, in a place called Kerala in India, and the, the host tree had died and rotted, rotted away, but the strangler persisted and it was actually large enough for me to climb inside. And yeah, that's, that's me sitting in the center there. So I know all of this sounds really sinister, but fig trees are actually great for their ecosystems. They're often called keystone species. And this refers to, it's an architectural term. If any of your parents are architects, they might be able to explain this to you, but let me show you a little diagram. Um, if the, it refers to a keystone in an archway that holds everything together. So if you remove that one central piece, the entire thing could fall apart. Fig trees are similar because they are so central to ecosystems. They bear a lot of fruit, as you can see in this painting of mine. There are so many little fruit that kind of look almost like Christmas tree baubles, don't they? Um, and these fruit can be found all year round. So that's opposed to a lot of other fruit, which you can find only in seasons. You know, you have an apple season, you have an orange season, a strawberry season, but fig fruit, you can pretty much find all year round. So that's a great resource for plants and animals to rely on, even in lean times. Um, so if you remove that fig from an ecosystem, then your plants and animals are going to go hungry. So that it's really kind of central to that um, to everything functioning really well. And there are so many different kinds of species of fig as well, including, including the common fig fruit that we eat. And um, okay, I'm gonna show you one more. This is a painting of mine of a plant called sundews. And again, you find that, uh, there are many different kinds of sundews. 
And these are the ones that are native to India, but you can find different kinds of sundews in the US as well. Um, and, but they all follow this same basic structure. They grow in areas where nutrient content in the soil is weak. So they found a way to sort of supplement their diets. Uh, can you see those sort of long sticky tentacles, the red things with like white dew like droplets on them. Um, so these are tentacles with which the plant traps insects and digests them. So they're basically carnivores. If we zoom in, we can see that in greater detail. You can see some of those little insects being uh, trapped by uh, the tentacles of the sundew. And this is the way that they, they kind of get more nutrients in their diet, the same way that you might eat more vegetables or you might take a little supplement if you're not getting enough of your uh, vitamins. And if you look at this illustration of mine, you might also notice that the sundews hold their flowers on tall, thin stems high above those moderate tentacles. And you know why they do that? They're basically um, avoiding trapping potential pollinators. Uh, so the, the little bee there that's going to pollinate the flower, it won't go anywhere near those, <laughs> those tentacles. So you, you can make sure that the, the bee doesn't get trapped. Um, so all of these strategies seem really amazing to us because we, we didn't realize that plants are capable of them, right? Um, but I think that if we actually start to question what we know, what we think we know about plants, we realize how incredibly fascinating they are because they have all of these really cool strategies. So if I asked you what a plant is, I'm just gonna guess, but I think you'd probably say it was, it's a green living thing with a stem and leaves and it grows out of the ground, right? But if we think about the strangler that I showed you, the, strang the strangler fig tree, which I showed you. Yeah, this strangler fig tree actually doesn't even grow out of the ground, does it? And I'm gonna show you another plant, which um, again, makes us question everything we know about plants because they, they aren't even green. Um, here we go, I'm just gonna go back there. Yeah, so look at these plants. They, they aren't green at all. And I'm, let me see if, if any of you actually notice something else that's really peculiar about them. They don't have any leaves. So these are called ghost orchids. And again, they grow on dark forest floors where access to sun, sunlight is really limited. So they don't have chlorophyll and they don't perform photosynthesis at all. Instead, they actually draw nutrients from dead and rotting matter around them. So the orchid's roots are in direct connection with the partner fungus, which in turn are drawing organic matter from the dead leaves um, surrounding them or from the roots of other plants. So these ghost orchids kind of defy our expectations of what plants are at all. And that's a funny thing. I would, I would like you all to maybe just look at the plants that you have in your gardens, or if maybe if you have some growing in your windowsill, or even if you just the fruits and vegetables that you buy at home to cook, and uh, see how much you know about them, what the what the original plant that they come from looks like, or um, where they where in the world they come from. A lot of the uh, food that we eat don't necessarily grow in our country, um, and they have some really interesting stories to tell, even the most common fruit and uh, vegetables that we eat. So in this period of lockdown, th there's something that I've done too, which is a hobby of mine. Um, it's just drawing plants. Um, you can draw anything that you see around you. Uh, this is at my local park. Um, which I drew before the lockdown. <laughs> but yeah, even, even now I can draw stuff that I see outside of my window. Um, and this is called nature journaling. It's a really, really important practice. Um, it helps us look at things a lot more closely and you notice details that you wouldn't have noticed otherwise. Um, you know, the texture of, of a flower, the, the way that it's structured, the number of petals it has, uh, these are all things that you notice um, when you draw things, which otherwise you, you kind of just look past. Um, these are some more of my nature journaling pages and they don't have to be very detailed. Uh, they can just be sketches and you can make notes alongside them. Um, so this is a, a tree that again, I drew at my local park. 
um, and it actually comes from Australia. Uh, and I didn't know that before, but I found out the name of the tree and I drew some of its different parts and I, and I looked it up online and I made little notes about it. So um, that now I, I look at that tree very differently than I did before. And yeah, these are some poppies that I drew uh, when I was traveling in Turkey some time ago. And again, I made little notes about it and uh, where it comes from. And I just I'm gonna end by showing you some of um, students in India, just like you who are learning about the plants um, around them through botanical illustration. And they've made little games out of them that they like to play to help them memorize facts and uh, learn things better. And Yep, that's it for me. Naruba, your work is amazing. Everything that you illustrate just looks so magical. It's it's definitely not the way I remember learning about plants in my science <laughs> textbook. And I think it's absolutely amazing. We've got tons and tons of folks online. I've got a couple of cool shout outs to give. Miss Corrigan's class, it's great to see you guys. So Trinity, Rashad, Josh, Anna, Ben, Lena, Carl, Levi, London. We've got school. Uh, I've got a couple of cool shout outs to give. Miss Corrigan's class. It's great to see you guys. So Trinity, Rashad, Josh, Anna, uh, Ben, Nina, Carl, Levi. Awesome. Um, New Jersey, Mississippi, the White Oak School, the Bruce family, Washington, DC, North Carolina, Florida, Massachusetts, Ireland. Tons of folks in India today, Narupa. Um, we've got a student named Natalie. Uh, who's sending in some great questions. We've got Aaron, Romy, Nakia, just, just so many people out there. I'm sorry if I missed you. I think you're wonderful. It's lovely to have you. We've also got folks up on screen with us. We can't wait to take questions from you. If you're watching along online, go ahead and start sending in your questions. Um, you only need to send them once. We're keeping track of them as they come in. So again, please only send them in the chat bar one time. I promise we're, we're keeping track. And if you're up on screen with me, get ready with a nice loud voice. But let's start with a question from Aria, who's wondering what mediums you prefer to work with when you're illustrating Europa. And let me turn your microphone back on. From Aria, who's wondering what mediums you prefer to Oh, Narupa, it looks like maybe you have the, the live YouTube video open on your computer. We're, we can hear it, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, awesome. um, yeah, what medium do I prefer? I like I do a lot of my colored paintings in um, watercolor. And um, so yeah, all of, most of the paintings that I've shown you in my presentation are in watercolor. Um, and then when I do sketches, like I showed you in my nature journals towards the end of the presentation, most of them are in pen. Um, and then I may add some color with color pencils or paints at the end. Um, I always start with pen, uh, with pencil notes. Yeah. Amazing. And then we've got Romy who's wondering when you're illustrating those great big trees, what's your process like? Are you mostly drawing and painting out in the forest? Are you bringing stuff back? How does that work? Um, so when I'm drawing the, um, the trees, I, I definitely do the sketches in, in the forest. So I, in one of my slides, I, I showed you the difference between the sketch that I do in the forest and then the painting that I do back at home. Um, so it's that process of drawing them in the forest is really important because from if I just had, if someone just sent me a photograph of that tree, it would look pretty much like the photos I showed you earlier in the presentation, which are really, it's really difficult to discern any of the details. Um, so, um, and it's also very cool that I had those botanists to work with who could help me actually distinguish uh, a lot of the details, which I can't even see with my own eyes. Um, and so I kind of come up with a lot of um, sort of questions that I ask them. Like I, I may ask them, what's the general shape of the tree? Does it look like a lollipop? Does it look like a Christmas tree? Um, does it look like a sort of, uh, like a ice lolly, you know, trees have, have different general shapes and they know because they know these species so well. Um, and then I might also ask them, what's the proportion of the canopy versus the rest of the trunk? Um, so yeah, and no, it's, I take sort of relative measurements in, in my drawings as well. So I'll say that the trunk should, should be about 50% of the total tree height. And so all of that information is actually included within the paintings. Um, and yeah, then when I, when I come back um, home, I refer to uh, photographs that I've taken of different sections of the tree, as well as my sketches. And um, yeah, I put, put it all together into the painting. 
Awesome. We've got Riley from Miss Henry's class up on the screen with us. Let me turn your microphone on. What's your question, Riley? Why do you illustrate nature? Why do I illustrate nature? Um, well, I love nature. I love plants. Um, so it, I think everywhere I go, I'm constantly looking at the plants. Um, I even use them as landmarks a lot of the time. Like someone may say, you need me by this building um, or, and I'd be pretty clueless about it. But then if they say that, you know, that's the street with that tree on it, then I'll, I'll know what they're talking about. Um, so I just love looking at trees and uh, that gives me the sort of uh, motivation to draw them. And I think that other people like looking at it too, because we've gotten used to uh, taking plants for granted. We may not notice the details very clearly if you just walk by a leaf that had fallen on the ground. But if you look at my painting of a leaf, then just the fact that I've taken so much time to paint all of those veins and the shape of the leaf and the texture of the leaf, I think it, it gives people the motivation to notice those details themselves. Speaking of time, Marcy and Nakia and some others are wondering how long you normally spend on any given watercolor. Um, so it depends. I, surprisingly, something like a flower is very easy to, I'm not very easy, but relatively easy to paint. So I, I might be able to finish one flower like um, in a day. And I know I'm, I'm a very slow painter. So I'm not one of those people who paints very quickly. Um, but I could find, I could finish a flower uh, in about, a day's time because the but if I was doing a leaf because there's so many veins and I want to get all of that accurately because the veins are so important like the venation is one of the ways in which we actually are able to distinguish different plant species um, so it's very important that I get that right so I might take even you know two days for just for one leaf if it's if it's a really big leaf um, and if it's an entire tree then I might take about a week and a half it's a long time on a tree, but they're so yeah. beautiful, so it doesn't make sense. We've got Avery up here with us. Um, she's got a question. I'm going to turn her microphone on now. Um, I was wondering when you first started drawing nature or just when you first started drawing in general? I first started drawing nature, I think about, it must have been about four years, four and a half years ago. Um, although I always when I and I actually never went to school to study art, so um, I didn't I didn't study art in college. But I did like drawing a lot when I was a kid. Um, so I've been drawing on my own forever, and I wouldn't say that I I drew nature in uh, uh, consciously. But when I look back at all of the, the things that I drew as a kid, I was constantly drawing plants. Um, so I I guess I was always there with me. We've got some folks online wondering how the weather, particularly monsoon season, affects your work. Um, so yeah, it's, it is very rainy in the in the south of India. So if it's <laughs> there's that one picture that I showed you in the swamps, right? So that's actually the second wettest region in India, um, and the wettest region in India is actually the wettest region in the world. So that's how <laughs> rainy it is. Um, but when you are under the in the thick jungle, you actually won't get it. You won't get the rain falling on you because the tree, the tree canopy sort of shelters you. Uh, so the minute you walk outside of the jungle, you get poured down upon. But inside there, um, you actually might not get very wet, except that everything is flooded. So your legs will be wet, but then the rest of you might. But yeah, we, we wear uh, ponchos and everything. If I'm doing a sketch, that's why my sketches are so rough. There's no way I could actually do um, those sorts of detailed paintings in the monsoon. Um, but I, there are some pretty funny uh, memories that I have of um, sketching um, at the side of the road, uh, like that, a road that runs through the jungle with someone standing behind me with an umbrella uh, just to cover my painting. And uh, yeah, some, yeah, it's, they're very rough sketches for, for, for that reason. <laughs> If it helps, they don't look rough to me or to any of these two visitors. I think it's I think it's just you being hard on yourself. I think they're beautiful. We've got another question uh, coming to us from Kennedy. Kennedy, your microphone's on. When you're in nature, how many people do you usually bring with you to paint and sketch? 
Um, I most of the time I've, I've had maybe like two people, two other people with me. Um, one person is usually a botanist, um, and uh, that botanist helps me find the plant that I'm looking for, and also. Uh, describe a lot of the details, the characteristics of that species to me, which I wouldn't have noticed myself. Um, sometimes the bark of a tree can be very um, important to distinguishing what species it is. And honestly, it took, the, took me them pointing out about like five different uh, versions of that for me to even realize what they were talking about because the, the differences were so subtle to me. Um, so it's it's cool to have a specialist along with you and then um, sometimes you, sometimes these regions can also have elephants or other like wildlife that you should be on the lookout for. So I've definitely had someone um, along with me who's, who knows the jungle really well. And so they would look, listen out for say bird calls that tell you that there are, there are certain uh, animals in the vicinity that you should uh, be wary of. Um, so yeah, maybe about two other people with me usually. So we've got Gino online who's wondering how you illustrate the twists in those really twisty trees. Is that challenging? No, that's actually that's actually the most fun part, I think, um, because it it's very organic. So it um, gives you a lot of sort of freedom to um, to do it as you please, as opposed to say a building where you'd have to be really careful of perspective if you were drawing a house or something. So I actually like the twists in the trees a lot. Love that. We've got the Bruce family sending in a question. They want to know what the favorite illustration you've ever done is and why. And further up the chat, another user, I'm sorry, I forgot your name, um, is wondering if you have any least favorite illustrations, anything that was really hard for <laughs> you. Um, um, my favorite illustration, what to say, um, but maybe, maybe this, the Strangler is one that everyone seems to like a lot. Um, although for me, I, I find it quite challenging to draw entire sceneries. Uh, I like drawing the ones which have white backgrounds. I find them easier to draw actually. And um, I can, you know, sort of put a lot of attention into the details, but I, I found that people like the sceneries a lot because they know where uh, the habitat that the plant comes from and the context that it comes from. Um, and ones that I don't like, um, <laughs> I think I initially, I've, and I still struggle quite a lot with drawing um, flowers that are white, because actually in, in watercolor painting, the kind that I do, um, we don't use any white paint. Um, so if you look, if you have any white part of the painting, it's actually achieved just by leaving that out. So the white is the natural white of the paper. Um, and the reason they do that is because they feel like white paint is usually very thick. And so it stands out of the painting much more than it should. It's sort of unna uh, unnatural color. It, it, th this is part of the watercolor tradition. Of course, white paint is used in, in other media, but in watercolor, that's yeah sort of frowned upon. Uh, so yeah, painting white flowers can be really challenging uh, because you have to achieve the shadows using grays and blues and greens, which you don't, but you have to be really careful about it because if you go too dark, then uh, your plants gonna, your flower is gonna look gray or dying, which is not a good thing. <laughs> We've got some really hard questions coming in, Narupa, warning you in advance. But Maggie and Casey are both out there wondering how many different types of trees there are versus how many different types of trees you've drawn. Oh wow! Oh my God! I've drawn so few of the total number of trees in the world. I think um, so. I actually googled this beforehand because <laughs> I preempted this question. <laughs> um, but I think there are about sixty thousand tree species in the world that we know of, and I think I've, I've done at most like thirty-five. Um, so there's a lot more to go. But I, I think um, that's what's cool about a botany and plants is that it's if if you're an artist, then it's kind of an inexhaustible resource of inspiration. You can just constantly go back and you'll never run out of things to draw, believe me. Um, and with plants, there are actually so many plants that are constantly being discovered uh, that we didn't even know about uh, all the time. So yeah, it's uh, 60,000 trees that we know of and the number of plants I think is about like 300 
thousand or three hundred and ninety thousand or something. Wow. Plenty, plenty of inspiration. You're absolutely right. We've got some educators from the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum who's wondering, um, have you ever published your drawings in books? Do they end up in museums? Where do these things go when you're done with them? Uh, so yeah, I actually have done two books. Uh, the first book was on the trees of the rainforest, the Western Ghats, that's the rainforest in Southern India. Um, and so yeah, it, it showed all of the, the trees in profile as I, I showed you in my presentation, as well as a lot of um, their, dis their fruit, flowers, seeds and leaves that we use to um, identify them. And the second book that I did um, was a more fun book. Um, and it was actually on the fantastical plants of the Western Ghats, as I, I like to think of them. So um, I chose plants that are just pretty crazy. So that those are the plants that I showed in the second half of my presentation. So that the carnivores and the parasites, and there are there are flowers that like smell of rotting flesh as well. Um, <laughs> it's, yeah, they do that basically to attract a kind of pollinator called the, a dung beetle. And the dung beetle. Um, so actually, I have a picture of it right here. Can you? You can see that, right? Yeah, so the, this flower is really huge. It's about, I guess it's about this big. Um, and it um, emits the smell of rotting flesh because it's uh, trying to trick pollinators that like to um, breed and feed on decaying matter into thinking that yeah, this is an ideal sort of habitat for them. And so it will emit that smell of rotting flesh and it actually even emits uh, a lot of heat um, because that's what a pile of like decaying matter would do. And it sort of also looks like a, a pile of rotten flesh because it's brown and purpley. Yuck, love it. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a bunch of people in the chat bar wondering about your nature journaling. Um, do you have any tips for getting started? And also how do you go about finding out the names of the plants as you're drawing them? Um, so in Bangalore, where I live, we have um, a botanical garden, which um, I'm sure there are quite a lot in the US as well. So in, in Bangalore, if anyone's here from uh, India, there's a Lalbagh botanical garden. A lot of the trees have names on, on them, uh, like they have a little nameplate. So that's really useful in identifying uh, the species. And um, if not, I also have little books uh, which, which have the common trees, uh, species of the place that I live in. Um, there are also certain apps, which maybe certain ones may be better depending on the region that you're from. Uh, but let me see. Um, so you can basically, uh, yeah, I mean, there are a lot of them. There's the Flower Checker, Nature Gate, Plantifier, Leaf Snap. Um, yeah, there are a lot of different plant apps where you can take a photo of um, a different, a particular species, and then it will help you identify what it is. It may, yeah, a lot. Sometimes it may not be that accurate, but it can be really helpful if the plant is quite common. Um, yeah, so that's that's a great way to identify the species that you're, uh, that you're looking for. Um, and so nature journaling tips that I would give you, uh, um, try and keep them all in one book so that you can keep uh, referring back to it. And it, it's also nice to uh, look at the same species over, over many seasons. Um, so when in flowering season, the tree may look completely different. Um, and then you may, it's also nice to note when it flowers. Uh, when the leaves leaves are out, um, when sometimes the tree may be completely bare. Uh, so it's, it's nice to know uh, when the flowering season is as well. Um, and I like to look at different, uh, different parts of the tree. Um, so that would help me identify it later on. And you can compare across species. So that's also really nice. I think initially I used to just draw them, draw my things on random scraps of paper and lose them. Um, which is fine because you don't have to take it too seriously, but it's nice to keep it all in one book because then you can, you can refer back to it across the years. Brilliant. We've got Avery with another question. Avery, your microphone's on. I was wondering how long you are in nature and like how long you stay with all those people in the woods and like how long it takes to sketch out your pictures. Um, so when I go, I might go for like, um, maybe about five days to a week 
Um, and most of these places that I go to have uh, scientists working there because they're doing research um, papers there or they're doing reforestation activities. So they will have like a, um, a research station that you can stay at. Or sometimes I have friends who live there as well on the outskirts of the jungle. And then we can, we can you know, uh, track inside the jungle to see whatever plant species we want. Um, and yeah, so then I, I, over the course of maybe one week, I would catch about six to seven trees. Um, and then I, and then that would last me about, uh, you know, a, one or two months because then I, I would sit and make all of those paintings when I came back and then I could go back to the jungle to the, do the next set of trees. Brilliant. We've got Miley, a sixth grader online, who's wondering if in your free time, you maybe take a break from nature. Is there anything else that you love to draw? Oh, um, what do I love to draw? I really like to draw, well, I like drawing, I, th I think something that really interests me is to um, sort of translate difficult sub subject matter into something that ordinary people can understand. So uh, my brother-in-law is a neuroscientist and um, most of that stuff goes off over the top of my head. Um, but um, he's doing his PhD and he, I, I, I'm helping him translate um, what he's, his research into like illustrations that can help people understand uh, what he's doing. Um, yeah, so that's, that's something I, I like to do a lot. Amazing. And we've got Cameron, who has a great question. Cameron, your microphone is not playing nicely with me. Would you turn on your microphone and ask your question? Do you only draw plants without blemishes? No, I, I do draw the blemishes as well. Um, I might draw, well, especially there are certain uh, leaves that, um, the way that they react to very heavy rainfall in the rainforest is that they they get quite battered with a lot of holes in them. So especially if that's characteristic of the plant, then I'll definitely include that in the painting. Um, I, I also think like decaying plants um, are really beautiful. So if I'm drawing it just for the sake of showing off how beautiful they are, then I, I might draw them in that state. Um, but if I'm drawing them maybe for for a more scientific purpose, for people to be able to identify them, then in that case, then I might draw it when it's most fresh because that will help people identify it best. Awesome, so cool, Narupa. I have a final question for you. Do you have any advice for all the young explorers out there at home joining us today? Um, so this, I was, I was thinking about this and I, I realized that even when I was younger, there were so many things that, uh, so, you know, I didn't know how they grew and it it surprised me when I realized like say pineapples I didn't realize if you if you look up a picture of how a pineapple grows it's quite strange uh, it grows out of the ground with like a lot of okay just look it up um, <laughs> or you you might not even know where uh, chocolate comes from it comes from the um, cocoa pod from the seeds of the cocoa pod or you might not know how peanuts grow peanuts grow underground and they're not actually nuts um, the legumes. So like all of this stuff is just really fascinating. So um, I, I think the advice that I would give people is like, I've shown you a lot of plants today that are uh, grown in India, but in the first place, you can find versions of, of a lot of these in the US. So it might be interesting for you to, to find sundews that you can find in the US. I've actually seen them at the National Arboretum in, in uh, DC. Um, and I've seen them going, I mean, I haven't seen them, but I've heard they grow wild in, in Florida. So it would be cool for you to see the links of, that, of some of these plants that we find in India. You can find a, um, related species in the US um, and you can look them up online. Or it might also be really cool to just look into some of the common foods that we eat, um, look up what uh, the plant that they come from looks like, and the most important piece of advice I would give you is to draw them because whether or not you are, you consider yourself an artist, I think drawing is such a useful tool to help you memorize things. Um, all of the trees and plants that I've drawn, I don't think I'll ever forget just because I have that visual memory of them uh, so strongly. So yeah, that's, that's what I would advise. <laughs> 
That's amazing. Thank you so much, Narupa. This has been just a spectacular way to start the day. For everyone out there watching, you can check out our Explore Classroom lineup as well as many, many more awesome educational resources at natgeoed.org. We've got tons of Explore Classroom events coming up. There's two more today even. Um, at 11 a.m. Eastern, we're gonna be live in the rainforest canopy with conservationist Andy Whitworth. So join us live in Costa Rica right on YouTube. Um, and at 2 p.m. today, we'll be tracking bats with social ecologist Edward Hermy. And tomorrow at 2 p.m. we've got Asha Stewart joining us to discuss documentary photography, all kinds of great stuff coming up. We hope to see you again on Explorer Classroom soon. Um, and for today, thank you again so much, Narupa. Let's sign off for now. Bye folks.